The work of Je Deleuze and Félix Guattari is one of my favorites, and it represents a radical shift in the trajectory of left politics towards the end of the 20th century. Now, that being said, it might sound great to just go and start reading their work, but anyone who has tried has witnessed the profound difficulty and upsetting nature of their work. One is told to start with their work Anti-Oedipus, but in fact, when you start reading this, you see how profoundly difficult it is to even get through the first two, five, ten, twenty pages. In this short three-part series, I want to give a primer on Anti-Oedipus, giving us the theoretical background we need, as well as just laying out in detail what it's like to go into Anti-Oedipus. Now, A Thousand Plateaus is typically seen as Deleuze and Guattari's seminal work, their most famous work. It's the phenomenology of spirit of Deleuze and Guattari. And I would largely agree with this. I think that it's a really important work in their corpus, but I don't think it is wise to skip Anti-Oedipus. In fact, I think Anti-Oedipus gives us the primer, which is presented in a much more academic style than A Thousand Plateaus, which actually makes it quite a bit easier. Anti-Oedipus is rather narrowly focused compared to A Thousand Plateaus on psychoanalysis and capitalism and the development of the state, whereas A Thousand Plateaus is going to burgeon off into the rhizome and linguistics and regimes of signs and the apparatus of capture and the birth of the state and, of course, a critique of Freud, just like basically all of Antiochus is. But in this series, I want this first part to be dedicated to Michel Foucault's preface to Antiochus, which is a really great primer not only on this work, but the large-scale trajectory and purpose of Deleuze and Guattari's work in general. In the second part, we're going to look at two short poems by Antonin Artaud, who is a famous French playwright, who really set the scene for a lot of the so-called 68 philosophers, Foucault, Lyotard, uh, Deleuze and Guattari, etc. And the third part is going to take us into the actual first few pages of Anti-Oedipus. I want to kind of go through it very systematically and very piecemeal so that one can kind of learn how to grasp one's bearings when they read this work, because I personally find their style very enthralling and very interesting, but it takes some getting used to, and it very much feels like when you start to read Hegel, and for me, Hegel was the first time that words started to become very specific. The difference between notion, idea, and concept. Hegel uses all three of those in rather different ways. And also words like moment and spirit and dialectic. And, you know, it is really much like learning a new language. And you will find many of these new words in Deleuze and Guattari's work. Flows, machines, schizes, and... The Body Without Organs is a really big one and a personal favorite concept of mine. So, in this preface, we're going to see Foucault really contextualize their work and give us some of these broader goals that Deleuze and Guattari are aimed at. So, in the beginning of this preface, Foucault outlines that Marx and Freud were typically seen as the standard thinkers around which to ally oneself in this kind of early post-war period, 1945 to 1965 here in Europe. And it was focused around ideas of repression and 
and also, of course, dualistic notions of structure and lack. So you had the Oedipus complex, and you had the lack, which deviated from that. And Foucault mentions that as we have, for example, fascism as it appears in Germany and in Italy, there was a growing challenge of, you know, Marx's thought basically laid out the upheaval of capitalism into communism as a historical inevitability that was coming soon, almost like a second coming, per se. But as thinkers were trying to rally around and figure out what was going on historically, there became a problem which was either centered around repression, and in which case it was rather restrictive, or we were left in kind of an open situation where we were going towards right-leaning ideals instead of breaking with them. And Foucault, when asking, was this really just Marx and Freud in the same incandescent light? Or was this rather something new? As he says here, it is true the old banners were raised, but the combat shifted and spread into new zones. So anti-Oedipus is not going to completely abandon the Oedipus complex as a possibility for how does the unconscious work, because that's what is contextualizing and really defining all of the and Quattari's work, is desire which, of course, is kind of the chief drive of the unconscious. And desire is something coded into us by the environment and also something we use to act in the environment. It turns us into a vector, as they call it in A Thousand Plateaus. It gives one direction and it orients one in a social field. In Anti-Oedipus, as Foucault says, it wastes no time in discrediting the old idols, even though it does have a great deal of fun with Freud. Most important, it motivates us to go further. That is really an important aspect of the Zinguetari's philosophy, is it is not abandoning rules as such. In fact, it is trying to figure out what are the rules of confluence that allow for practices to emerge, for traditions to emerge, for structure and form to emerge. It wants us to look at the rules of the game, but once we figure out what those rules are, we will naturally find openings from which to spring forth in creative action. Now, Foucault mentions, and I think this is so perfect, is this is not the new theoretical reference. It's not a question of, oh, this is our theory of everything, like it's talked about in physics today, for example, of, oh, we need a theory of everything can, that can account for all these um, differing theoretical and indeed hermeneutical problems and this is not the philosophy that we always needed when hope is lacking. Foucault rightly says, anti-Oedipus is not a flashy Hegel, right? This is not some totalizing project of theoreti theoretically deducing all the possibilities of future. Because, right, Hegel in his project is concerned with a philosophy of history, really the first of its kind, of mapping out what are the trends that allow things to interact the way they do, which is what Deleuze and Guattari are doing. But Hegel puts underneath this, this dialectical unfolding of history, of these opposites are coming together, they're being ameliorated and being sublated, and their truth extends to some future, gradually perfecting state of absolute spirit, guided by rationality or reason as the underlying principle 
So for Hegel, his system basically amounts to, by the time you get finished with the phenomenology of spirit, you should be able to basically predict the future. You should be able to map out a pre-made path of how to get to this point of absolute spirit. And I know a lot of Hegel scholars will be like, no, Hegel doesn't really say that. In fact, he leaves quite a bit open and he states that this is going to have to adapt to each historical moment. But I think at least in abstract, Hegel already has a model um, that he has mapped out. But as Foucault says, anti-Oedipus is best described as an art. It is putting together all these pictures of multiplicity, of flows, of arrangements and connections, and analyzing this all in a machinic way. And as Foucault says, it's less concerned with these questions of why this or that, but how to proceed. So there is an explicitly political element within Dodo's and Guattari's work, which is precisely political in the broadest sense, political of mapping out how power is invested in an environment and how that relates to human action. And not explicitly or only human action. It's not a humanistic philosophy. In fact, it's post-humanist in many regards. But it's important to note that it is centered around action. Deleuze and Guattari are worried about concepts. They want to find these unifying concepts that work within a social field. For example, in the context of the military, we have unifying concepts like duty, which are going to take a number of material things that just exist and amalgamate them together in the form of practices and traditions and rules, which are going to define how a certain utterance or a certain action is related to other things in the military assemblage, for example. And in Anti-Oedipus, Deleuze and Guattari are going to use desiring machines instead of the assemblage. The assemblage is more of a concept they use in A Thousand Plateaus, and they do so because they've said, and Ian Buchanan mentions this in his Assemblage Theory and Method, which is a wonderful piece of scholarship on Deleuze and Guattari, um, he mentions how Deleuze and Guattari really abandoned the design machine because it had been misinterpreted. It really had done what it could, and they felt like it couldn't really be used in a radical enough way because maybe it had too many connotations or whatnot. But the important thing here is figuring out, as uh, Foucault says, how can and must desire deploy its forces within the political domain and grow more intense in the process of overturning the established order? So that is the revolutionary kernel within this. Is It is overthrowing the established order. Notice it is not overthrowing order as such. Um, if you read the How Do You Make Yourself a Body Without Organs chapter of A Thousand Plateaus, Dodos and Guattari make it very clear that this concept of the body without organs, which really is this revolutionary, you know, um, employing desire and freeing of it, of it, of its constraints in order to become more intense, that the body without organs is not about overthrowing organs. It is about overthrowing organization, which is to say being reduced to an organ, reduced to a deterministic, hierarchicalized way of functioning. And thus, I really think the idea of an erotic art is a great way of talking about Deleuze and Guattari's philosophy. Now, Foucault mentions that there are three adversaries that Anti-Oedipus is concerned with going against. The first of these is, I, I like this term, the sad terrorists of theory those who want to preserve the order and, I mean, he mentions that they're civil servants of truth with the capital T here. This notion that we should 
probably this would be like the Hegelians or like the Neolacanians. These people who are probably as Dodos and Guattari and Foucault too would see it holding on to these orders of the absolute, of the abstract, which get in the way of revolutions. Um, but I think it's better put in this second point here, the poor technicians of desire. So this is psychoanalysis and semiologists, as it's said, that wants to reduce desire to a structure, which would be the id, this kind of primal structure of desire which pre-exists and um, allows for desire to be invested in a very particular number and limited number of ways. Deleuze and Guattari are concerned with how does desire escape these structures like Oedipus or indeed phallogocentrism, for example, as Derrida puts it. For Deleuze and Guattari, there are no representationalist structures of, oh, this is how desire will always operate eternally under the you know, castration complex, or the Oedipus complex, or the phallus, or whatever it may be, that desire is uniquely productive in a social field. It is what constitutes both the ground upon which actions play out and the trajectory of actions themselves, and thus it is not only productive, but it is not reducible to a structure because it's so particular to an environment. And this is a really important aspect, which is a central one in a thousand, or sorry, Anti-Oedipus. And I think one of the key reasons that you should read Anti-Oedipus before A Thousand Plateaus is they lay out rather explicitly what desiring production means, which is really going to summate their notion of being a post-structuralist, of not reducing philosophy or psychology or semiotics, indeed, to structures. And then this last point is super important, that Anti-Oedipus is concerned with being against fascism. And as he says, not only historical fascism, the fascism of Hitler and Mussolini, which was able to mobilize and use the desire of the masses so effectively, but also the fascism in us all, in our heads, and in our everyday behavior. The fascism that causes us to love power, to desire the very thing that dominates and exploits us. And this is something that Zingratari mentioned very early on in Anti-Oedipus. And this is why I think if you can just make it to that 50-page mark in Anti-Oedipus, you kind of are hit with the concepts in their original bruteness, but things start to settle in and start to make sense. So never fear, especially if you can get to this point where they are talking about fascism. I think it's around page 26 in the Penguin edition. This PDF that I've got here is the uh, Minnesota Press edition, but I think it's got the same translators, so it might just be a difference of format, but it's same page numbers, maybe? I'm not sure. I have the Penguin edition myself. But Deleuze and Guattari are concerned with not how did people get duped or tricked into tolerating fascism, into tolerating the Dritte Reich, the Third Reich, the final solution. How did they not get tricked into this? But how was desire technically made suggestible to these notions that Hitler was talking about. And I've mentioned this in previous lectures, but when you look, of course, at the historical situation of Germany with the exuberant post-World War I debt that they were asked to pay and the subsequent um, hyperinflation of their currency and this loss of cultural unity, that lack of form, that ambiguity in the air it really does make sense, not why people would be duped into thinking this is what they want, as if there was some primal want, which everyone wants, that's a big thing to those in Guattari you're trying to get out of the way, 
but rather it really makes sense how people could genuinely want this sort of um, oh, let's go back to the purity of the Aryan race. Let's go back to our roots, which we see to today in a lot of populist rhetoric in the U.S. with Trump, and we see it too in the U.K. with um, Brexit, as well as in Hungary. It's quite big in Hungary. But the question is figuring out how desire works in a field. How does it operate? This is very functionalist. It's not a question of how ought it, but how does it operate, which is going to require us to look indeed at the historical situation, but in it, it is crucial to note this when looking at the Desenguetari. Pure material and pure temporal succession of events, that is not enough to figure out how desire works in a situation. You can't just look at, oh, this event happened, and then this event happened, and this event happened, because those don't make sense without the context of concepts which stand to rally in all these material facts into some coherent structure. Things like duty or the Aryan race, like the Aryan race doesn't exist. It was a made-up concept by Hitler and indeed by people before him whom he is drawing on to create a concept which has no reality but in this situation becomes rather hyper-real. It becomes a reality in which people find themselves not because there was some original hidden self, but rather because the self was constituted and mechanically engineered in these historical situations. So in Deleuze and Guattari's work, they are looking not just as fascism exists historically, but how fascism exists as a mode or a tendency of function to which we are all drawn, as Foucault calls it, the fascism that causes us to love power. And this is not like just being enamored with power. This is like seeing power as some sort of spectacle which one grows to love romantically in the sense of, oh, it gets me back to my true self. I would be incomplete without this other. That is the fascism that is latent within all historical situations of if people are lacking some sense of unity, that lack of a sense of unity right now can be used and operationalized to say, oh, but we had it in the past and we can get it. So really, this is a question, as Foucault says, of lifestyle, of an anti oedipal lifestyle. And it's how do we rid our speech, and I really like this, our acts, our hearts, our pleasures of fascism. How do we pursue the slightest traces of fascism in the body? So we're not going for some sort of asceticism where we ignore the rules and we just go radical with a capital R. Like, that doesn't exist. Deleuze and Guattari want to figure out how to be radical in the current system. They talk about um, making language shudder instead of stammering in speech, something akin to that, in A Thousand Plateaus, of, okay, how do we make the order burst from within? And in order to do that, we are going to be basically charting an introduction to the non-fascist life, as Foucault puts it. And I think that's a great way to talk about this. Now, Foucault mentions that there are a couple essential principles which he says really summarizes this introduction to the non-fascist life, anti-Oedipus, as a guide to everyday life. Now, be careful, because 
Deleuze and Guattari, he mentions when he calls this the first work of ethics in a long time that he knows the authors wouldn't like that. Um, and in a sense, they wouldn't because, like he said, this is not a flashy Hegel. This is not a everything has been set out on the table. They precisely state in A Thousand Plateaus that you have to insist that what is here is not all that is, that there are possibilities in the future which are not deterministic, which are not historical, but rather ahistorical. They are not reducible to an event precisely because they depend on concepts whose charting and mapping on a specific set of material conditions is not laid out in advance. So we have to keep in mind that this is a guide in the loosest sense, in a sense really as a guide of things you should look out for rather than things you should be explicitly doing. So the first principle here is to free political action from all unitary and totalizing paranoia. And these totalizing paranoia, these would be the structuralist concepts of Freud's Oedipus Complex or Chomsky's grammaticality, as it is critiqued in A Thousand Plateaus. These are the concepts which claim to be all-encompassing and pre-social. This could be the dialectical unfolding of history, reason as the driving force of history. These are really methods, as Nodes and Guattari see it, of forestalling genuine creativity. They restrict and they organize the political body into you can do this and only this. And then the next is develop action, thought, and desires by proliferation, juxtaposition, and disjunction, and not by subdivision and pyramidal or hierarchicization. I would have said hierarchicalization, but whatever. And the point here is, and this is a kind of a little tendency that makes capitalism and schizophrenia dangerously close to each other, as does in Guattari see it, is that they both essentially operate like a cancer insofar as they proliferate. They go beyond boundaries. They operate by juxtaposing elements that don't, quote-unquote, need to be juxtaposed together. And in a sense, they are both creative because of this. But Deleuze and Guattari will make some sharp distinctions between the mode of functioning of capitalism versus schizophrenia, capitalism being essentially ruled by the despotic signifier, by an abstract notion of how it ought to proliferate, which in fact merely creates a fuzzy aggregate, as Deleuze and Guattari put it in A Thousand Plateaus, as opposed to schizophrenia, which knows how to have this sober con contact with the elements like the nomad in his territory and knows how to find these traces of fascism in the body and stomp them out. So what is being concerned with here is a creative process of proliferation that doesn't work by hierarchically expanding, which would be Hegel's work, because it essentially works on, oh, we've got all this difference, which is gradually being sublated up to this point of absolute spirit. Instead of that, we've essentially got a flat ontology, so to speak, to use a, a term of Graham Harmon's, where there's no hierarchical inherent difference between, say, humans and animals and rocks and all this stuff. But we've got it all laid out on a plane organized by desire, which is going to set up if there indeed, and there will be, hierarchies. But they won't be eternal hierarchies. They will basically be circumstantial. And then the next one, which I think is really important, is withdraw allegiance from the old categories of the negative. Law, limit, castration, lack, lacuna, which Western thought has so long held sacred as a form of power and an access to reality. Prefer what is positive and multiple, 
difference over uniformity, flows over unities, mobile arrangements over systems. Believe that what is productive is not sedentary, but nomadic. So the way we produce, the way we create, for example, art or music or poetry or indeed philosophy should not be organized around systems which function on notions of the negative or indeed structures which will make the negative have a definite function like it will in Oedipus. Certain ways of using desire will be lacking. They will not be what is proper for someone to do. And thus, instead of focusing on these as our methods of creation, because, right, if we hold on to that, think about in the art sphere. I mean, how boring would that be if art was governed by these forms that no one thought to transgress? You would just end in a cycle of reproduction, which is, that's kind of a point of Baudrillard, is that We've got this system of reproduction that is oriented around these abstract notions, which are in fact not innocent of reality, of value, of meaning, for example, that Deleuze and Guattari too are trying to go against, that there's some original meaning or real desire, as if it was transcendent, as if it was some abstract signifier. Instead, They're trying to opt for a philosophical system which is affirmative, which is going to focus on the place where a system cannot account for all the difference and use that difference, which is to say lines of flight, as they put it in A Thousand Plateaus, as our guiding principles for what are our ways of creating something unique. What is our way of being nomadic, of being sensitive to the territory, letting the territory move us and shift us instead of trying to forestall that movement, and in so doing, create something unique that couldn't occur if we just held ourselves down by some abstract principle? And then I I really like this one. Do not think that one has to be sad in order to be militant, even though the thing one is fighting is abominable. It is the connection of desire to reality and not its retreat into the forms of representation that possess revolutionary force. So once again, desire is not a representation of, oh, this is the ideal form that desire takes. And this filter, the Oedipus complex, is going to allow for only certain things to trickle down. Instead, we're taking a rather joyous, I mean, it really is a fröhliche Wissenschaft, a gay science, as Nietzsche puts it, of the 20th century, in which the revolutionary force is precisely that desire and reality are inextricably linked and are not separated by some transcendent gate which is going to prevent certain functions from being able to be treated as equally as others. And then this is a really important one, which I think um, many theorists should keep in mind today. Do not use thought to ground a political practice in truth, with a capital T there, nor in political action to discredit as mere speculation a line of thought. Use political practice as an intensifier of thought, and analysis as a multiplier of the forms and domains for the intervention of political action. So there are domains and practices and forms and practices which exist already. And our goal as philosophers, as creative thinkers, is to look at the organizing principles that allow for those processes to function and find the holes in them, find ways to engineer them, which doesn't focus on organization, but focuses on intensification of bringing out those things which are not so overt, bringing out marginalized voices, bringing out new methods of thought that have not been yet accounted for or exhausted. And then... We've got 
do not demand of politics that it restore the rights of the individual as philosophy has defined them. The individual is the product of power. What is needed is to de-individualize by means of multiplication and displacement, diverse combinations. The group must not be the organic bond uniting hierarchized individuals, but a constant generator of de-individuation. And that idea of a constant generator of de-individualization, this is a process, right? Deleuze and Guattari are process philosophers, if we can use that um, term. I think we can with, you know, with not much hesitancy. But in this situation, there are no primordial rights that are just inherently there. That is what Deleuze and Guattari are trying to go against. Because the notion that something innocently is there, that we even know what is or there means in the abstract, as if we can abstract away from reality, that is fascism as a concept. That is a microfascism, as they call it in A Thousand Plateaus, that is latent within all modes of formation and action, which is going to individualize precisely in the sense of creating an individual, of organizing into a hierarchical function, into a field that becomes immobile. And in order to forestall that immobility, in order to free mobility, we have to insist on diverse combinations, which of means, of course, do not become enamored by power, he says. And all this comes together in a very interesting style in which, I mean, Foucault points out the difficulty of translation here, but the traps of anti-Oedipus are those of humor, which I think is so critical, which is this book is not a dry academic text. It's meant to be fun. You're supposed to laugh. You're supposed to like cackle like a little girl, which I think is precisely the exciting element of this project. So many invitations to let oneself be put out, to take one's leave of the text and slam the door shut. The book often leads one to believe it is all fury and ga fun and games when something essential is taking place, something of extreme seriousness. The tracking down of all varieties of fascism, from the enormous ones that surround and crush us, to the very petty ones that constitute the tyrannical bitterness of our everyday lives. Right. So we are concerned not only with these big forms, these macro-fascisms, but, as they are called in Deleuze and Guattari's work, micro-fascisms. The little ways in which desire is constituted and organized which is essentially going to forestall the creative process. So I hope this has been helpful in getting a sense of Deleuze and Guattari's project and some of the key unifying themes within particularly Anti-Oedipus, but throughout their corpus in general. Watch any of my other lectures, which I've done on Deleuze and Guattari, postmodernism, German idealism, feminism, Leave any constructive or non-constructive criticism in the comments below, and I'll see you in another lecture.